Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for tuning into this Bible study. Today we're going to be going through Genesis chapter 41. It's a little bit of a longer one, but uh, there's a lot of good content in here. This is where um, Joseph is brought before Pharaoh to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. At the end of this, we're actually going to talk about dreams. I'm going to share uh, a vision I had when I was uh, 19, 20 years old, 20. Uh, as well as a dream that one of my friends had uh, that was very clearly um, a prophetic dream from God. So we'll talk about those at the end. Um, but before we dig into scripture, let's dedicate this time to God. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we are able to take the time to study it. Uh, bless this time, Lord. We love you. We thank you. Please uh, speak through me. Open up our, our ears and our minds and our hearts uh, to be receptive to your word. Speak to us. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 41. Up until this point, Joseph has been in prison uh, in Pharaoh's prison in Potiphar's household. Potiphar is the captain of the guard. Uh, it's actually been 13 years since Joseph was sold into slavery. And we're going to uh, talk about that today. How do, we, how do I know specifically it's 13 years? Well, we're given some dates in, in Genesis 41. So I'm going to read through all of Genesis 41. It is uh, near 60 um, verses. Um, yeah, total is 57 verses. And then we're going to go and break it all down. So join me. Uh, if you don't have, so I'm reading from the NIV. If you don't have an NIV, feel free to just sit back and listen as opposed to um, be caught by comparing the translations and lose the story. Sit back and enjoy it. Regardless, even if you don't, even if you have an NIV, um, sit back and enjoy and listen. Just, just be open to listen to what uh, the Spirit might tell you. Genesis chapter 41. When two years had passed... Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile when out of the river there came seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the riverbank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. In the morning, his mind was troubled. So he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today, I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was angry once with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows, fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I'd never seen such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first. But even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so, 
They looked just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. In my dream, I saw seven heads of grain, full and good, growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. I told this to the magicians, but none of them could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up after are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of time, excuse me, seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but Seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance of Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered, because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dreams are given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt, so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all the officials. So Pharaoh asked them, Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt, Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger, put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And people shouted before him, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift a hand or foot in all Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zaphnath Panea, and gave him Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentiful. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end, and seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. When all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. Then Pharaoh told all the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do what he tells you. When the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians. For the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was so severe everywhere. So now we see a slave 
second in command of all of Egypt. 13 years prior, almost killed by his brothers, sold into slavery to some Midianite Ishmaelites that were traveling south as traders. He goes down to Egypt and is sold into Potiphar's household. Potiphar is the uh, um, captain of Pharaoh's guard. Uh, and and does great while he's there, but then Pharaoh's wife gets the hots for him uh, and wants him to sleep with her, and he says no over and over again, and eventually she gets uh, very aggressive, and he runs, and she claims attempted rape uh, because he just won't have anything to do with her. And then he gets thrown in prison. Joseph gets thrown in, thrown in prison, and it's in prison where he interprets dreams for the cupbearer and the baker, and the dreams come to pass. Joseph specifically says to the cupbearer, when you are put back in your position, remember me. Uh, I am wrongfully prosecuted. Remember me before Pharaoh. And two years goes by, and then Pharaoh has a dream. And it's at this point that the cupbearer remembers, ah, right, I had a dream, and there was this Hebrew guy that was in the prison that was able to interpret. So he shares that with Joseph. So going through this, the first thing that I noticed, um, so I have, not that this really matters, but so I use my NIV, I enjoy it. I think in the balance of word for word versus thought for thought translations, the NIV does a phenomenal job. But I am constantly comparing the text from my NIV to other translations, to the King James, the New King James, the ESV, etc. And in this instance, uh, today's study, I'm going to pull out, I think, four times, three or four times, where a word is not necessarily translated in the way that I think is appropriate in one translation versus another. And the first word that jumps out to me in that manner is this word sleek. So Pharaoh has this dream, and verse 2, um, he was standing by the Nile, when out of the river there came by seven cows, sleek and fat. Now, when I think of the word sleek, it is a positive term, but it's not a, a, a large thing. Like if I was telling my wife, like, oh, that dress looks great on you. You look very sleek. Like I see it as being thin, beautiful, but thin. Uh, it, and so the, the context. So let's look at the different translations. The King James has the word favored. The Amplified Bible has healthy, the ESV has attractive and plump. And I think that context always informs meaning. That is uh, uh, something that I, I suggest every Bible study, Bible study or Christ follower should memorize is context always informs meaning. What does that mean? It means that when you look at what is being said around your phrase, it informs meaning into the words themselves. We use the term sleek differently than even I would wager back in the uh, 60s and 70s when the first NIV uh, was translated. I think that it is more appropriate, the ESV, attractive and plump, makes total sense because you're talking about these um, cows that come out that are attractive and plump and healthy and fat. Now, ugly and gaunt is what I have for my NIV the, uh, in describing the unhealthy cows the, that represent the seven years of famine. The Amplified Bible has raw boned, which I like that illustration. King James has ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and the ESV has ugly and thin. I think it's always a good thing when you, whenever you see something that's like it just doesn't quite fit, use any of the um, online resources, Blue Letter Bible, Bible Gateway, Bible Hub, any of these, and look at how that same phrase is translated in all the different translations, and that will help also inform meaning. Okay, as we, we continue on, you have the grains, and the grains get scorched. The seven years, the grains that follow the years of plenty, those grains get scorched by the east wind. This is verse 6. This phrase, um, scorched by the east wind, this um, weather anomaly um, in Canaan is known as Sirocco by the Canaanites. In Egypt, the Egyptians would call it uh, Kamisin. Uh, I don't know if that's the proper pronunciation. It's K-H-A-M-S-I-N, Kahamisin, something like that. It is the east wind. It is um, a wind that comes across the desert that is very, very dry um, and ruins crops. Um, this is referenced in Hosea 13, 15. 
Now, one thing that you should know is, is that the Nile, one of the reasons why we see in Genesis, it happens several times where they will travel from Canaan up in Israel and they'll travel down to Egypt during a famine. Why is that? The Nile River Basin floods every year. And as a result, even when you have drought throughout the land, the Nile typically provides enough water that Egypt will have grain, will have crops, which is why they would constantly, Abraham went down, um, Isaac was tempted to go down but did not, And we see that Jacob in the next chapter is going to go down to Egypt. He's going to send Israel, he's going to send his sons, 10 of them, uh, down to Egypt to get grain. It's just an interesting agricultural element as far as the east wind. So verse 8, we have Pharaoh's mind was troubled, and understandably so. He has back-to-back dreams in which um, their livelihood cattle as well as grain that's their sustenance whether it's the meat or the uh, produce from the field that's their sustenance and he has this very vivid dream um, regarding both of these things and he has a similar dream twice so he woke up very troubled and he asked all of the magicians uh, and the wise people of Egypt to come and to tell him what the dream is this is very very similar to Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He doesn't tell anybody what it is, and he asks for all the magicians uh, and the wise men of the land to come and not only interpret the dream, but tell him what the dream was. He's so apprehensive um, that they're just going to tell him what he wants to hear and make something up that he wants whoever it is that's going to interpret this dream to actually tell him what he dreamed so that he knows that the interpretation is proper. There are a lot of similarities between um, Daniel chapter 2 and Joseph uh, and and the the king of dreams as he's so called. So the cupbearer Here's this dream. None of the magicians are able to interpret it. Cupbearer remembers Joseph in prison, tells Pharaoh about him. Pharaoh sends for Joseph. An interesting element that gives us an insight into the culture is before Joseph was presented before Pharaoh, he was shaved. One of the things we know about cultures is that the Israelite culture, the Arab culture, favored beards. It was a sign of wisdom and respect. And if you were um, going in mourning or if you were going to um, be ceremonially cleansed, it, in- cleaned, it involved actually shaving your head, shaving your beard, etc. But um, Canaanites valued the beard. Unlike that, in Egypt, they preferred to be clean-shaven Now, I don't know if it was just his beard that was shaved or if they also shaved his head. Whenever you see uh, hieroglyphics, oftentimes uh, the Egyptians are um, shaved completely. We don't know which is which, but uh, it's an interesting element. No doubt, I mean, Joseph's been in prison for a minimum of two years, uh, probably more like five or six years at this point. Um, And he's a servant, he's a slave, he's in prison. So they clean him up make him look good before he goes before Pharaoh. So then this is really interesting is, is that Pharaoh, you got to keep in mind, the Egyptian culture sees Pharaoh as deity. He is ordained by God to be their king, but he has, uh, uh, actually has a level of deity himself. He speaks for the God, so to speak. So to be in his presence these magicians, these wise men, are and his staff, everybody around Pharaoh is going to um, totally just play to him and say, oh, yes, Pharaoh, oh, of course, Pharaoh, whatever you want, Pharaoh. But when you read the way that Joseph interacts with Pharaoh, he's bold. He gives him bold advice, and he doesn't shy away. Pharaoh says, okay, I hear that you can interpret dreams. I want you to interpret this dream for me. And Joseph says, no, I can't. (laughs) But God will. I love that. He stands up to to Pharaoh and he doesn't say, yes, I'll do my best. He stands up to Pharaoh and says, no, I can't do that. But God in heaven can and will. 
Now, this is another interesting point at which we have three or four different interpretations of um, this, this interpreting of dreams, right? So the specific phrase, my NIV has, God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. If you have an ESV, it says, God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. And that gave me pause. The Bible that I read um, when I'm down having breakfast and just doing my quiet time is an ESV. And I enjoy doing that so that I'm exposed to multiple different translations and little things jump out. And that was one of them is, is that God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So my question was, when I read that, I was like, interesting. I wonder if Joseph is intimidated by Pharaoh and says, God will give you a great interpretation of your dream. God will bow down to you and make sure that your dream is a good dream. The King James, I really actually prefer the way the King James translates this. King James says, God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. This is the idea. When you compare different translations and the context of what Joseph is saying, he's not saying that God will give you a favorable interpretation of your dream, but it's similar to if you are having chest pains, right? Or stomach pain. Something is off in your system and it goes on for a week or two weeks or three weeks and you don't know what it is. It causes you stress. You do not know the answer to what this is. You go to the doctor and you the doctor does all kinds of tests. And let's say hypothetically that the doctor comes back and says, okay, well, the diet that you have of eating three Italian sausages every night for dinner is not good. You have high acidity and you are just having heartburn. Or, you know what? You actually have exceptionally high cholesterol and you are on a path to a severe heart attack. We need to change your diet. We need to change your exercise. Both of these situations, the doctor is giving you a diagnosis that provides you peace. I believe that that is what is going on here. I believe that Joseph is saying to Pharaoh, God will give you peace in that he will let you know what your dream means. King James says, God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Not saying whether it's good or bad, but you'll have peace about it. I want to actually flip over to Daniel. So leave your um, finger here in Genesis 41 and flip a good chunk over to Daniel chapter 2. I'll give you a second to get there. Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up on verse 26. So this is Daniel is in the presence of King Nebuchadnezzar. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand that understand what went through your mind. This is the same situation between Daniel and Joseph. Both of them give credit to God as the interpreter of the dream. They themselves do not take credit for it, but they say God is the interpreter of the dream. God gave to Nebuchadnezzar specific dreams of what is going to happen. And this is an amazing prophecy. Daniel is full of prophecies. One of them in particular, read it, Daniel chapter 2, read the whole thing. And it speaks of this massive statue that goes through the different kingdoms of the world, which we are in the midst of the, almost to the last one. You, you need to read it for yourself, uh, but it is a prophetic word about what is going to happen relating to the kings of the world, kings of Israel in the future. It's really cool. God gave to Daniel the interpretation of this. In the same way, God gave to Pharaoh the visions, the dreams, two dreams, both had good and bad in them, and then God gave to Joseph 
the interpretation of those dreams for God's will to be done. Okay, repetition. Have you noticed the amount of repetition that we have here? We have two dreams, as I just mentioned. They are twice. They have the same meaning, but they have a good part and a bad part. Also notice that the dream is told in the narrative twice. You have at the beginning it's told and then Pharaoh says it again. So as the readers were told this dream twice. Genesis 37, Joseph, Genesis 37 is where Joseph is introduced to us. And this is where he has two dreams. The first dream, if you'll recall, it's where there's uh, the sheaves of grain and the 11 sheaves of grain bow down to Joseph's sheaf, sheave of grain. And his brothers uh, can't stand this because he's the second youngest. And they're like, what, you think we're going to bow down to you? He has a second dream, and in this dream, the sun and the moon and 11 stars bow down to him. Then in Genesis 40, we have the cupbearers. Two dreams, good and bad. Also in Genesis 40, they are given twice in the narrative. You see them twice. It's just an interesting element. And Joseph actually explains to us why they were given twice. Why is that significant? The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two form is, is two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. We're going to talk more about dreams uh, in a little bit at the end when we talk about uh, application. Verse 37, the plan seemed good to Pharaoh. Uh, and to his officials. And in my mind, um, no wonder. In my mind, no wonder the plan seemed good. Think about this for a second. So Pharaoh has this dream. He's unsettled about what does it mean. He needs to provide for the land. He needs to provide for the people. But I mean, he's Pharaoh. He's uh, the monarch. He's also worried about his own wealth. So then Joseph interprets this dream. And immediately after uh, he interprets the dream. Joseph then gives him advice and says, you need to find someone who's discerning that can look over all the land and can tax the people 20%, a fifth of everything they produce is going to be taken in and held uh, 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 for the years of famine. But Pharaoh will be responsible for this. Joseph is advising Pharaoh to tax the people of all of their grain. What politician wouldn't love this situation? I mean, think about it. Whether or not the famine comes or goes, he's increased tax and there is now an expectation. Pharaoh, who is his deity, has had this vision from Ra, from God, that this, this thing is gonna happen. And so he's gonna put this tax in place. Now, it also, uh, it's an interesting element is, is that we have, there's no mention, I don't know if you noticed this, but the, the, the advice that Joseph gives at this point is that Pharaoh should store up for the seven years and store it up, and then when the famine comes, give it back. There's no mention of selling it. There's no mention at this point of uh, Pharaoh getting wealthy off of uh, taxing the people. But if you notice in verse 56, at the end, um, flip with me to verse 56, uh, when the famine had spread over the whole country, so Joseph has been in power, number two in command for seven years now, the famine hits, Joseph opened up the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians for the famine. We are going to see, as we continue reading in Genesis, it's not until Genesis 47 that we see the full scale of how rich Pharaoh comes, becomes from this. But what ends up happening is that seven years, abundance, their storehouses of grain that are put up, uh, so abundant that they can't even keep track of it, like the sands of the seashore. We're going to talk about that in a second. Then you have the famine. The famine hits and they start selling the grain to the Egyptians, selling their own, own grain back to them, right? So they've, they've taxed them 20% of all their produce, and now they're taxing them on what they already gave them. Sounds like uh, New York State. Sorry, total tangent. Um, 
But at any rate, they run out of money. The people run out of money because the famine is so severe, they have to buy over and over again. They have to buy grain. So then Joseph then says, okay, well, um, you don't have any money. Sell me your livestock. You will still manage it. You, it'll still be your livestock, but it'll belong to Pharaoh. They say, okay. So they sell all their livestock. Pharaoh then owns all the livestock in Egypt. Then all the livestock in Egypt, they have nothing else to sell. So then Joseph then... They, the people sell their land and themselves into servitude to Pharaoh. And thus, Pharaoh now owns all of Egypt, all the land, all the livestock, all the people. Now, we do see in 37, there is a saving grace here. We do see in 37 where uh, Joseph puts the people in charge of the land and he only takes 20% of the land and gives the people back 80% of what they produce. So Pharaoh owns all of it, but the people are allowed to keep 80% of it. Uh, so he doesn't hold it over them as severely. But through this whole process, the point that I'm getting at, Pharaoh likes the plan. And I, I don't know. I can't know. We cannot know Pharaoh's heart. We do not know if Pharaoh actually believed that this, that, that this dream was from God and he fully believed that this was going to happen and he believed Joseph's interpretation by God of this dream or if he simply wanted to make more money. I don't know which it is. But Pharaoh believes Joseph, puts him in charge, and because of that, he becomes very wealthy. Verse 38. Can we find anyone like this man in whom the Spirit of God, in, in whom is the Spirit of God? This is an interesting line interesting verse. And we're going to talk about the different translations, but the first thing that I want to hit on, the Spirit of God. Joseph is the only individual listed in Genesis to have been indwelt by the Spirit, to have the Spirit of God in him. Now you may say, well, hold on, Dave, wait a sec. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, specifically it says, the Bible does say that God was with them. Yes, it does say that. Uh, Abraham, Genesis 21, 22, Abimelech clearly says that God is with Abraham in everything that he does. He does say that. Then in Genesis 26, verse 27 through 28, in reference to Isaac, Isaac says, why have you come to me since you were hostile to me and sent me away? They answered, we saw clearly that the Lord was with you and also with Jacob. Genesis 30, 27, Laban, his father-in-law, tells Jacob that he, Laban, has been blessed because God was with Jacob. We know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs, God was with them, but that is different than saying that the Spirit of God was in them. Now, Spirit of God, let's, let's do a quick little word study on this. Uh, Ruach Elohim. Ruach Elohim is the Hebrew phrase, uh, and it literally is Spirit of God. Where else in Genesis do we see this? At the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the deep. The Spirit of God hovered over the waters, and God said, Let there be light. Spirit of God. That is the exact same phrase that's used here. Now, today, we have both the Hebrew Bible, uh, the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament. And as a dig deeper challenge for you, doing a study on the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit interact with us today versus the Old Testament? And just as a hint, just as a little bit of a guide, in the Old Testament, we see instances of the Holy Spirit interacting on a one-on-one -on -one basis with individuals. Samson, Judges 15, we see the Spirit of God was on Samson and he did a mighty feat of strength. Also, Ezekiel 11.5 references Ezekiel says, The Spirit of the Lord fell upon me or came upon me. Instances in which the Spirit interacted on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis. Now, how is that different today? 
How do we interact with the Holy Spirit today? What single event changed all of that? Try reading Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, uh, to dig a little deeper into the difference. Uh, Jesus specifically spoke about uh, what would happen after the crucifixion and the resurrection and what was to follow that. We see the outpouring of that in Acts chapter 2. If you want to dig deeper, read Acts chapter 2. Okay, verse 43, second in command. Joseph is put second in command, and the title that he is given uh, in context uh, was likely, historically speaking, the title that he was given was probably vizier, grand vizier. And when I read that, in, it was in multiple different commentaries that that was likely his title. Immediately, the, the picture that comes in my mind is Jafar from Aladdin. Disney is everywhere, and Jafar was what I pictured because Jafar was uh, the sultan's uh, grand vizier. So that is just simply a title for number two in command. Then you have uh, these different names. In verse 45, we see that Pharaoh called Joseph Zaphanath Panea. What does that mean? We don't know. Scholars don't know. Uh, my NIV has a little footnote saying we don't know what it means. Um, the translations uh, from the different, um, uh, the, the commentaries gave me, we're not really certain. One interpretation says that it might be the one who knows, but we do not know exactly what that name that Pharaoh gave him meant. Uh, Asenath um, is Joseph's wife uh, in this arranged marriage. That name, Asenath, means she belongs to Nath. Now, Nath uh, was an Egyptian goddess. Asenath's father, Asenath's father, is Potiphera. Now, Potiphera, it's not correlated to Potiphar. Uh, Potiphera um, was the priest of On. Uh, that name, Potiphera, means he whom Ra has given, which is appropriate. Ra was the sun god of Egypt. The priest of On officiated at all major festivals, supervised lesser priests, was served. He served the sun god Ra in the temple city of On. On was called Heliopolis by the Greeks and was an important city of Ra worship. Heliopolis literally means city of sun. It's all correlated together with Ra worship, sun worship. Um, this city, Heliopolis, uh, was located 10 miles northeast of Cairo. So Joseph has this arranged marriage with uh, Asenath, uh, whose father, Joseph's father-in-law, is a pagan priest of Ra. Um, interesting elements, right? It's an arranged marriage that immediately put Joseph into one of the most influential families in Egypt. So he immediately is named number two. Uh, he is the grand vizier. And this arranged marriage now puts him in a family of prominence. Some people have issue with this, have issue with the fact that Joseph is intermarrying into the Egyptians. He is not holding to his Egyptian culture, excuse me, his um, Israelite Hebrew culture. Uh, he's not being set apart. Well, you have to keep in mind a couple different things. One, what are his options? First of all, Pharaoh is king over everything, and this is an arranged marriage. Joseph likely didn't even have an option in this situation. He simply had to say yes. But also, what are his marriage options? What Israelites are there? At this point in time, Jacob has not come down. Israel, the tribes, have not come down. It's not going to be for another seven years minimum. Joseph's probably around 40 years old, realistically, when Jacob and the Israelites and all the family all come down. So his options are very minimum. We also do see in chapter 42, after the marriage uh, and after the seven years of plenty, Joseph has um, cat. Sorry, my cat is over here. You can't see her in either of the camera angles, but she's knocking into things as every cat does. Um, proof that the world is not flat. If it were, cats would have knocked everything off of it by now. Sorry. Good grief. Totally threw me off. I was on a roll. Totally threw me off. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So issue with um, chapter 42. Chapter 42, um, we see... 
uh, Jacob. Famine is going to hit Canaan. Jacob is going to send his 10 sons minus Benjamin. So he has 11, he believes he has 11 sons left. He holds on to Benjamin, sends his other 10 sons with a caravan down to get grain from Egypt. And there we see the brothers reunited. Joseph is reunited with his brothers. They do not recognize him, but we see a specific line in which Joseph says that he fears God. So despite the fact that he is thrown into, into the Egyptian culture, his head is shaved, he's, he is now uh, the Grand Vizier, he marries into this high-profile Egyptian family, and yet we know from Genesis uh, 42 that he still fears God and holds to his faith in God, which is great. I don't really have that much of an issue with um, him intermarrying um, into the Egyptian culture because I don't think he had much of an option, but he holds his faith. Chapter 46, we, we now get some dates, some ages. Joseph was 30 when he went into the service of Pharaoh. Uh, Genesis 37, 2, we learn that Joseph was 17 when he was sold into slavery. So you just do the math. We then know that it's been 13 years. 13 years of time has passed since he saw his brothers and now is in Pharaoh's um uh, he's number two for Pharaoh. In that 13 years, he's in Potiphar's household. We do not know how much time in Potiphar's household he's in prison. Realistically, we know it's a minimum of two because it's been two years since he interpreted the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker, but he was already well in his position in the prison at this point. So chances are he was in prison for five, six, seven years. We don't know how much time he was the head of Potiphar's household and how much time. Then we also know that he's 30 when he starts. We know there's seven years of plenty and then the famine hits Canaan. So we don't know if it's year one of the famine or if in Canaan they are able to last out for a year or two before they come south. We don't know. But chances are he's 37, 38, maybe even 40 when he's reunited with his brothers uh, in Genesis 42. So it's going to have been a long time, a good number of years, more than half of his life that he's going to have been away from Canaan when he reunites with his brothers. Okay, verse 49. Um, verse 49, we have sand of the sea. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. For those that have been traveling through Genesis with us, that should sound familiar. This is the third time that that phrase has popped up. Uh, sand of the sea is referenced in Genesis 22:17 to Abraham and in Genesis 32:12 to Jacob. Both of these are reaffirmations of the Abrahamic covenant. I will bless your descendants and I will make you into a mighty nation. Your descendants will be as numerous as the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. So it is a, uh, a paying homage to the Abrahamic covenant that was affirmed to Abraham and affirmed to Isaac and Jacob. Now the names uh, Manasseh. Manasseh, as uh, is explained here by Joseph, God has made me forget all my troubles. The word Nasa is the Egyptian, excuse me, is the Hebrew word for forget. That is the same uh, base and sounds like Manasseh. Uh, as you look, uh, Manasseh has the same Nasa as the, the base for it. Then you have his other son, Ephraim. Uh, Ephraim is how you would pronounce it in the Hebrew. Ephraim. Um, most people, uh, English, call it Ephraim. Call him Ephraim. Double or twice fruitful is what his name means. And the reason being is, is that Eprat is the Hebrew word, uh, and it's called place of fruit, uh, fruitfulness. And the dual masculine form of Eprat would be Ephraim or Ephraim or where we get Ephraim. There you go. So that's his two sons and they are going to come back. We're going to talk about them more. So as we wrap up, 
Oh, it looks like we haven't spent too much time on this. I thought it'd be a bit longer, but we haven't gotten an application and who knows how long uh, I have some stories to share. So we still have a little bit of time and Lily is absolutely enjoying this. Uh, for those that are listening and aren't able to see, um, <laughs> the cat is enjoying Genesis 31. Okay, application. Here is a question. Does God still speak through visions and dreams today? That's a great question. There are some that believe that no, that that time has passed, um, that that the uh, empowering of the Holy Spirit no longer happens, the speaking in tongues, uh, seeing, giving prophecy, all of these different, a prophetic word, these things don't happen anymore. There's also the school of thought that everything that's outlined in Acts still happens today. I do personally believe that God does very much still give visions and does still uh, give us dreams. When you look at um, uh, eschatology as the study of end times, one of the things that's said over and over again is that old men and young men will dream dreams. I believe that as we get closer and closer to the end times, God is going to speak directly to individuals and give them dreams. So here is a practical application um, of what happens if you do have a dream or a vision. Now, I want to share um, a vision that I had. I was a freshman in college. It was October of my freshman year. Uh, this is back in 1999. It's going to date me just a little bit, but whatever. Uh, fall of 99 is when I... Um, gave my life over uh, and, and submitted. It was specifically uh, Revelation 3.20 where Jesus says, I am here. Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. And to those who hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. It is God's open invitation that I want to have fellowship with you, but you have to open the door. So I, uh, it was uh, fall of 99 in which I opened the door and started that journey. Then it was a full year later in which I spent that entire year of this battle of the flesh versus the battle of the spirit. It is this element that every Christ follower goes through and we never actually um, fully finish it until it's, it's this idea of sanctification or spiritual development. It is this battle of the way the spirit would call us to be through spiritual disciplines. this When you become a believer, there is this gap of how the Spirit calls us to live and how we actually live. And the only way to bridge that gap is through submission and through the spiritual disciplines. And slowly, day by day, God changes us from the inside out and we slowly become the man or woman that God wanted wants you to be. So for me, I had a horrible, horrible first year. Um, I was still very much living in the flesh and had, I was having to deal with repercussions of that. So I had this vision, uh, it was a waking vision, but I saw, I saw just total darkness, pure blackness. And right in front of me was a stairway going up into the black. And I could see the few steps, just two or three steps. But then I looked up and I could see illuminated a door that was open, that was just exploding with light. And it was the light from this open door was lighting up this stairway that clearly connected from the steps that I was on to all the way up there, blackness in between the two. And there was a man that was walking up the steps that turned and looked back at me. And I realized that it was me. God was giving me this vision of this man that he wanted me to become, that was following after him, that was pursuing him one tiny little baby step at a time. And he didn't illuminate in between here or there. All he allowed me to see was just that first few little steps and then knowing that there is a future. I do have a vision for you. I do have this place for you as a man of God pursuing after me, filled with my Holy Spirit, pursuing me. So that was a vision that I was given to say, hold strong, keep going, uh, uh, fight the fight, 
one little baby step at a time, but know I am with you. And it has been with me ever since. So here is some advice for if you do have a vision or a dream. First and foremost, most important thing, does it contradict scripture? The Bible is truth. If you have a vision or you have a dream that somehow gives new revelation, it's not from God. You will not receive a vision or a dream from the Lord that contradicts his scripture. So, if you do have a dream that tells you that it's totally appropriate to sleep around with multiple different women, God wants you to share your love, I would argue that that is not of God, but that is either of your sinful desires, the flesh, or it's demonic. We do live in a spiritual world. There is a spiritual battle that takes place. There is good and there is bad. And just as, as God can give you a dream that is good, I don't see why Satan can't also influence you and the flesh can easily influence, influence you to give you a dream that goes against scripture. So if you do have a dream, what I would suggest that you do is first and foremost, if it contradicts scripture, you know then that you shouldn't take it as uh, insight or as prophetic. It, it very well could have also been the pizza you had the night before or those three Italian sausages that you ate um, that are just influencing you and it was just a dream. What I do when I do have a dream uh, or a vision or anything along those lines, is I ask for validation. I pray on it and I ask God, if this is of you, validate this. Give me confirmation. And either that may be that I have a similar dream with the same meaning or the exact same dream again, or someone speaks a prophetic word. And what I mean by that speaks a prophetic word, it is somebody else says something to you that only God could have inspired. Someone speaks into your life something that is clearly God speaking through that individual and they reaffirm that uh, vision or that dream. Pray on it and ask God to reaffirm and ask him to tell you what are you supposed to do with this dream? What is the interpretation? Uh, I want to share a story. One of my friends, so I haven't had a vision or a dream in 20 plus years. Uh, not since th that is the last vision I can think of. I do dream on occasion, but as soon as I wake up, Dream's gone. I can't remember it. They're, they're just gone. When I was in high school and junior high, I used to have what really felt like foreshadowings. They were very, very, very vivid dreams. And I knew when I dreamed them that it was a glimpse into the future of something that was going to happen. But it never informed uh, anything other than just me seeing into the future. Weird, but those stopped basically at college, etc. And I haven't had any sense. There's a friend of mine, a good friend, who... The Holy Spirit works in this guy like crazy. And he has visions and dreams. And it, it, it might sound goofy, whatever, I don't care. But man, oh man, God speaks to me specifically through his dreams. And he shares with me. He knows the ministry that we have. So he'll have a dream. He'll pray on it. And then he has to decide if he's going to even share it with me or not. Most of me does share. And sometimes he's like, Dave, I had this dream and God specifically told me that I need to share this with you. And I want to share one of those dreams with you. This was uh, a good period of time ago. It was last year, I think during the summer. So this is the dream that he had. Saratoga Performing Arts Center, SPAC, is a huge music venue that is here in Saratoga. Um, big name artists come through. Um, I've seen Mumford & Sons, Dave Matthews Band, uh, Steve Miller Band, etc. Huge music venue. So in this dream... There's this massive parking lot on Route 50 that is huge. Just this massive uh, cement and gravel parking lot. In this dream, there's this concert that's going on. And it's actually not at SPAC. It's in the parking lot. At the end of the parking lot is this humongous stage. It feels very much like a music festival. And there's hundreds of thousands of people are in the audience. And they're all Christians. You know how in a dream you just know something? So they're all Christians. And they're all dancing to this music. The music is amazing. So my friend, he's, he's in the crowd. 
and everybody's dancing and he looks up, he looks at the stage and the lights and the music and it is just, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. The music is just awesome. The rhythm is so good and the lights, the theatrics, it is just, it's amazing. He is blown away by this and he's looking up at the stage and he's looking out at the audience and everybody is rhythmically dancing to this music. It's almost, it's almost as if it's a trance. And he looks up at the stage and the light twists just right. And he realizes that it's Satan. Satan is the lead uh, performer up there on stage. And the light shifts again and it goes back to being this band. And he's just like, whoa, oh my gosh, what is happening? The, the, what is this? And as soon as he stops, people around him are like, dude, this is amazing. Why aren't you dancing? Dude, what are you doing? Everyone around him realizes something's wrong. Why, why are you not doing this? We're supposed to be doing this. This is amazing. You, everybody's watching this. Everybody's doing this. You should be watching this and doing this too. And he looks up and he's like, something's wrong. This isn't right. But man, this is just amazing. The music is so good. The lights, everything. This is amazing. And then he says, no, 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 stop. I can't, I can't, I can't. And then he wakes up. A day later, uh, the interpretation came to him. That venue, the stage, uh, the music, the lights, all of it is Hollywood. It's Hollywood. The Bible makes it clear. Who, question for you, theology question, who is the prince of this world? Who right now holds the title deed to earth? Who is in charge of earth? Satan is. The devil is. We are, as believers, we are in enemy territory. The vision, the dream, and the reason why he shared it with me was to share it with you in this warning to Christians that we are absolutely captivated by Hollywood. Disney especially, oh my gosh, some elements of Hollywood are, are overt and subtle. Disney has gotten more and more aggressive. And Hollywood, uh, uh, Amazon Prime, Netflix, uh, Disney Plus, Paramount Plus, just go through all of them. Apple, all of these, the media in general, Satan is in charge of it. Satan is in control of it and he's manipulating it. He's manipulating it to the extent that there are Christians throughout the globe, throughout the developed world, that are absolutely hooked. And they are watching things that are messages that Satan wants us to watch. And they are, I mean, people uh, justify it and they say, yeah, I mean, it's not that bad. There's some stuff that's bad, but I don't watch that stuff. I don't watch any of the uh, stuff that is uh, um, NC-17 or TVMA. That status. I mean, Game of Thrones, that was that status. Game of Thrones is softcore adult content is in that. There's all sorts of, of material that we justify and we say, well, I'm mature enough. I can discern. I, I know the difference between good and bad. You are affected by what you see and what you spend your time watching. I remember hearing years ago, 10 plus years ago, that the average American watches four hours of television a day. And that was 10 years ago. How much are we allowing ourselves to be completely influenced ever so subtly by Hollywood? That is the caution. So when my friend shared that dream with me, I prayed about it. I waited two weeks and I had a clear uh, validation that I was supposed to share it. And there was a video that I came out with, and I'll put it at the end. I didn't share his specific dream about SPAC because I didn't want to freak everybody out, and I didn't want, um, I didn't want people to be uh, uh, to think only about that the way of the message was this weird random vision. I share it with you to to give that the the vision brought about the same conclusion. Christian, beware. And so that was what I shared. And I had no plans of actually telling that dream to you specifically that my friend had um, until I was doing this study and realized, wow, I, I have to share it. 
So if you have dreams, I do believe they're going to get more and more prophetic, meaning talking about end times, and it's going to be just like my friend's dream was. Does it contradict scripture or validate scripture? And pray about it. Ask for validation and affirmation that it is a word from God. There's no question that 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 dream was a word from God that I was supposed to share with you. So take it or leave it. That's what it is. So now as we close, discussion questions for your small group to have with your spouse. Um, What stories have you heard of dreams? Ask your friends, ask your peers at church, uh, the people in your small group of visions and dreams that they have had. It is amazing when you hear how God has chosen to speak into people's lives through dreams. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you still interact with us today, that you love us and that you care about us and that you want us to have your peace and you want us to to dig into your words so that we can build up our defenses. You warn us of what is coming. Lord, I pray that we would be open to and heed your warnings, that we would study your word and that you would speak to us, that the word of God would speak and that we would hear it, and that we'd be submissive to it. Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, we are going to see the brother that was sold into slavery reunited with his brothers. Now, his brothers are not going to know who he is for quite a while. Uh, It's been a very long time uh, since they saw their 17-year-old brother, uh, and now he's the Grand Vizier. But famine is going to cause Israel to come down to Egypt for food, and as a result of that, you are going to see the fulfillment of the dreams that Joseph had, the uh, 11 sheaves bowing down to him, the star and the moon and the 11, 10 stars, 11 stars, 11 stars, the the sun and the moon and 11 stars uh, bowing down to him. We're going to see that happen. I love you guys. Have a phenomenal week and join me next week as we get into uh, Genesis uh, 42 um, as we continue with the story of Joseph. 